Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 1st of November 2023. Let's go to where we normally start, the Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply, of course, you can find them in the description to my video below. 680 personnel lost, which is a downtick from previous days where we've seen it in the 800s. 12 tanks, 30 armoured personnel vehicles, that's a high number there, 12 tanks is not as high as we have seen but that is still really significant 23 artillery systems is nothing to ignore there i mean that is another big number um although we have seen it of course up to as many as 50 lost in one day two multiple launch rocket systems one anti-aircraft warfare system 28 drones there were quite a few drones last night, quite a few drones the night before. There were some early ones last night, so it could be a, a conglomeration of the two different nights there. And then we have 34 vehicles and fuel tanks, which is another really high number in that category, three pieces of special equipment. So uh, a fairly bad day for the Russians again, losing significant numbers in certain categories. I think armored personnel vehicles shows that there are still these attacks going on in Avdivka and actually other places. I'm just going to show you uh, a few bits and pieces in this segment going forward. But first, we'll go to Andrew Perpetua. He did his live stream last night. Always check out his live streams. Uh, packed full of so much interesting information he has on some really good guests as well uh, these are the losses he could find as a mapper looking through all the socials and he tries to look for russian uh he tries to look at russian sources a lot more than ukrainian to try and give himself uh, a proper understanding of what's going on make sure he's not being too biased towards ukraine and you can see here that even given that the russians are losing again a four or five to one ratio of equipment to the Ukrainians that is really uh, really damaging for the Russians but let's look at the types of stuff that either side are, uh, are losing we'll go to the Ukrainian side and there is just one tank a Leopard 2A6 uh, abandoned uh, leaking and on fire actually that's in the Avdivka area where there's a Bradley and a, a Leopard uh, have been lost around the same area I'll show you a still from what I think is that one is almost certainly been destroyed as well I would have thought um, pick up cars and vans, taking up most of them. These drone drop grenades, probably civilian owned, all of these come from one particular uh, um, one particular telegram source from a unit in um, in the Kherson region, in the Dnipro River region. And Andrew Perpetua actually talked about this on his live stream. He said this one unit it shows two types of videos only. One is either spotting for... Uh, one presumes for the aviation for the FAB 500 bombs and the other is dropping IEDs exclusively on civilian vehicles and he's like there is no way all of these are military or in fact possibly there's a high chance that none of them are military in other words these are Russians dropping IEDs on civilian targets and, you know, he's questioning, you know, why are they doing that? I mean, that looks pretty much war criminal to me. Uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd have to agree with him there. I mean, the the, uh, the footage is just basically dropping uh, these IDs on civilian parked cars outside civilian houses along the Dnipro River Delta. Uh, it's just, yeah... Again, if you're a pro Kremlin voice, you know how do you justify things like that? When we look at the Russian losses, oh, and there's a P-18 radar uh, taken out by a Lancer, so obviously that's going to be uh, a problem for the Ukrainians losing radar capability there. Uh, when we look at the Russian losses, we have another TOS 1A being lost as yet again uh, a, a significant piece of kit that uh, the Russians have lost there. BM-21, another multiple launch rocket system. Uh, and then you have APC tanks. You've got T-90M again, as well as T-72 B3s, uh, B3M. One with a mine roller there. Uh, and the rest are IFVs, again, showing obviously some civilian trucks and unknown bits of kits as well. But again, showing probably uh, combined arms maneuvers going on with the Russians uh as I say, Avdivka, but also other places. So let's look at this, and I presume this will uh, feature in some of uh, Perpetua's losses here. So a column 
full of Russian mobilized soldiers from Chuvashia was wiped out during a recent HIMARS strike. Actually, it might not be because there isn't any HIMARS. No, so he might not have uh, have this on his list yet. The amount killed it reportedly exceeds 100 people. This is really significant stuff here. Uh, the the destroyed equipment is quite varied uh there are quite a lot of as you can see civilian sort of minibuses and, and whatnot and bukanka vans uh, these are as as it says here a column of russian mobilized um chris owiki goes into more detail about this so as many as 120 volunteer russian soldiers from the chuvash republic are said to have been killed or wounded in the ukrainian high mars strike against a russian military convoy is this significant because Hymars don't generally get used against moving vehicles, so either that's interesting and uh, Hymars has hit a moving target, or it's more likely that these guys were stopped and they had enough intel to get that done really quickly. That's why I find it quite interesting. Uh, maybe the convoy stopped for the night, I don't know. Local authorities appear to be trying to cover up the losses, says Chris O'Wiki. The angry Chuvashia Telegram channel reports that while it, it was preparing to move on the 29th of October, so preparing to move, the 1st Battalion of 1,251st Motorized Rifle Regiment was struck by Gimler's missiles fired by Ukrainian forces. The regiment includes many Chuvashians, one of whom commands it, According to the survivors, up to 120 men were killed or wounded, with 10 Kamaz and UAZ trucks destroyed. The volunteer battalion, known as Atal, and formed from local residents in mid-2022, was almost completely destroyed. Men from the battalion had videoed themselves only a few days earlier celebrating their deployment uh, with dancing and the chanting of slogans such as Let's Return Russian Lands from Alaska to Kiev. Uh, well, that didn't uh, age well, did it? Um, Angry Chuvashia reports that the Chuvash authorities have warned people about commenting on the attack. Quote, inaccurate mention of a rumour is considered dissemination of false information and reposting dubious materials may result in liability. Despite this warning, uncorroborated lists of the casualties have been circulating. So far, 19 are reported to be dead, another 40 wounded, but this cannot be confirmed or denied and may well be only a partial accounting. So so at at the very least 19 dead 40 wounded and possibly 120 casualties in total um really significant hit there and there is there is an idea that ukrainians might need to get back to hitting large accumulations of troops as they had done previously with high mass strikes but then the russians adapted these kind of strikes i think are really important to to really hit the russian capability well, the capacity of the russians to then uh, commit to further attacks now a, a further column here is here this is a significant loss again to the russians 14th brigade destroyed a russian column consisting of tanks and armored vehicles reportedly in the kupiansk direction one tank two bmps were destroyed additionally three tanks and four bmps were damaged so a first of all a significant um, um mechanized equipment assault there going on one would think rather than just moving and being stopped by really good um artillery activity by the ukrainians so another uh, loss where they are losing a lot all at once and then this then leads into your justification for these kind of high figures that you see on days like today now on on the flip side it has to be said that the ukraine are losing uh they have lost a number of leopard tanks leopard 2 tanks recently in several areas so the interesting one about this and this is the one that was mentioned on perpetua's list and it was spitting fire out the front here not quite sure exactly how it was damaged the video that records it cuts between showing the tank and then showing it like this unfortunately so it's a russian video um but so it could be an atgm could be a mine could be some blowout inside the vehicle itself um all the as far as i understand all the crew survived which is one of the benefits of these tanks but that was lost in avdivka so it goes to show that actually some significant forces have been moved by the ukrainians up to avdivka to stop any further russian advances there but they have lost a number of leopard twos and, and some of these are also getting lost to fpv drones and it has to be said and again go and check andrew perpetua's live stream really interesting chat about fpv drones and it's and their chat really does uh, sort of correlate with all sorts of other information coming through. FPV drones are 
a game changer. So they've been used on a wide scale basis for sort of four months or so now. They've been used previously, but on, on a kind of mass scale, they started getting used by the Ukrainians a couple of months before the Russians. Uh, as I've said previously, there was a lead time, but the Russians have, have now, they've caught up. The question is, are they using them to the same uh, volume i guess as the ukrainians given that ukrainian have support from people like united 24 given them huge amounts of drone capacity but the russians are using them effectively against the ukrainians these have been a game changer because you're starting to see so much kit taken out by this so about half the artillery and a third of the armored vehicles of the russian armed forces are taken out with the help of fpv drones according to statistics from the drone army ukrainian fpv drone manufacturers say about 12 to fifteen thousand. They send about twelve to 15,000 to the front every month. That's how many of these have been used. And they're also starting to use um, dive bombing drones. These are useful because they can effectively do the same as the FPV loitering munitions, like one-way drones, but you get the drone back, hopefully, uh, at the end. And if these are like five, $600 drones, $1,000 drones, then that's pretty useful going forward. Uh, but I think uh, dive bombing drones will take a bit more, um, a bit more training for the operators. And it's a, arguably a lot more simple to drive a drone, fly a drone into something rather than to dive bomb and, and return it back to base. Right. The drones have become a huge game changer. Obviously, we're talking about first person view drones here, but I've really just noticed the idea that you can't go anywhere without being spotted, right? Whether it be a column that sat here, it could be satellite imagery involved in that, or a column like this that, that's driving on the way to somewhere. If it's Avdivka, Kupiansk, you know, Robotina, Kherson, wherever it is, nothing is safe anymore. It doesn't matter how good your tanks are. They are vulnerable to, to drones. So whether you're using Abrams or Leopards or, you know, T-62s, they are going to be susceptible to these drones. If one of them doesn't get it, then the third, fourth, fifth will get it. There are so many of these drones flying around the skies. We have moved it. I really think we've moved into this new era of warfare where drones are just, in all their different capabilities, are that important. And nothing basically hardly anything goes unseen and that means whether it's an attack across the river in Dnipro or whether it's an assault in Avdivka using mechanized equipment or if it's a deep reconnaissance group uh, on foot in Kupiansk wherever whatever it is the chances of being spotted are really high you not only got uh you know, surveillance and comms systems set up on Mars and in trees and whatever you've got satellites and you've got drones it is so difficult to spring surprises. You can say the Avdivka attack was was a, essentially a big surprise, but once you spotted those things coming, you get the artillery in and you destroy massive amounts of equipment. It is so difficult, I think. It, going forward, it's going to be so difficult to to take ground, essentially. we can. I'm going to do a video on the counter-offensive, the Ukrainian counter-offensive that, you know, really appears to have ended now. Uh, and whether that can be seen as successful in any way, I don't think it can be seen as successful in taking ground. If that's your metric, then obviously it didn't do very well. But there are other metrics you can measure, but of course they would be metrics that were adapted, they were changed from the initial. So if you're just going on the initial objectives, then it was a failed counter-offensive. But you know there's adaptation that went on and and it all kind of changed but i'm going to do a video on that but the significance of drones even in in you know in all of the activity in the counter-offensive cannot be underestimated for both sides um right going on to and, and there are new drones coming out so in that live stream they're talking a lot about um nighttime drones not so much thermal imagery like the high-end nocturnal imagery but much lower end capability so you're not making the drones crazy expensive so what's happening at the moment is that russians are moving at night so i wonder whether something like this this column here was hit at night maybe um or was yeah maybe preparing to leave or whatever but you are starting to see a number of um Vehicles get hit at night by certain drones. There was a one in Kherson region, a, a multiple launch rocket system that was firing at night because it's safer to do so. Uh, but then an, a drone with nighttime capabilities hit it and took it out. 
you, the Russians move their troops. They restock their supplies and depots at night. Everything happens at night now because of drones. Now, if we're moving into a, a an evolution of capability for drones particularly i would assume that would happen with the ukrainians before it happens with the russians but they'll eventually catch up you will get a, 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 that could be another game-changing moment because the russians you know they say oh you know don't don't do this in daytime we do it at night do that at night do that at night and if it's like well now we can't it doesn't matter whether it's a night or the day, we're still going to get hammered doing whatever that activity is, then that changes behavior significantly. And that for, for me would be a bit of a game changer. So we could be moving into a, into a new era again in drones in terms of nighttime capabilities on the lower end of the, of, of those capabilities rather than really high end expensive thermal imagery that we have seen, right? We have seen this for some time as well, just dropping IEDs, but more like, FPV drones using low-end uh, optics, nighttime optics, to hit a target uh, and blow up. Overnight, so moving on to distance strikes. Overnight, Russia uh, attacked with drones and missiles, a total of 18 out of 20 drones, and one KH-59 that was launched was shot down. I don't know if some of this has changed now because there's uh, some news coming out that over the waters of the Black Sea, Air Defense Forces destroyed two KAR-X-59, which were launched in the direction of Odessa uh, Air Command Piveton has said. So there might be some more cruise missiles taken out as well. Uh, nonetheless, the, what we are seeing is a larger wave of drones used last night, and luckily, eighteen to twenty. There is a uh, were taken out. There is a worry as I listen to the Kiev Independent um, journalists being interviewed on uh, Ukraine. The latest, very interesting interview that was talking about how uh, there are worries within the Ukrainian factions that um, the the even the Kiev air defenses could be overwhelmed if Russia released the, some some huge waves of. Uh, missiles and drones that that people are genuinely worried about uh, that the the we've seen a very quiet effectively end of summer and autumn period where the claims are that russians are stockpiling if they release them all at once or in, in successive waves and kiev could be overcome and it could be a real real nightmare for the ukrainians uh, and again you know this will bring about arguments about whether ukraine should be able to target things tar targets within russian borders um, I, I'm getting to the point where I'm frustrated with the West in in not getting ATACMs to uh, to Ukraine soon enough. I'm frustrated with F-16s being delayed. Yeah, you know, the West should just be going like you can hit Russia wherever you can do whatever you want. Here's all the stuff you need. Just bloody go for it because otherwise this thing's going to drag on seriously long, and there will be such a lack of appetite for continuing in the general public and a lot of nations and politically speaking in continuing to help Ukraine, and that will aid Russia and the destabilizing of the geopolitical landscape worldwide would will be massively significant and that you know you could i don't want to like blame the helpers here but it's it's the the it needs to be everything and now rather than little bits all the time the same conversations we've been having for what well, a year and a half maybe um right the russians are and I, I know I don't report on this every day, but again, Perpetua talked about this last night. Here's another example. Russian strike on a curse on city centre the morning of November the 1st killed a female employee of the city military administration. The administration's head reported. That looks like it might have been a military target. But what we are seeing across along the Dnipro River on the west bank on the right bank of the river the ukrainian controlled side is successive days well every day um of fab 500 strikes now it might be the 250 kilogram version it up to the 1500 kilogram version just absolutely hammering the towns there on a daily basis don't even gee whiz been a long time guys been a long time. Thanks, music gremlins. Thank you. Welcome. You're one day off. Halloween was yesterday. Now bugger off. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah, and it seems like on a great deal of these occasions, the Russians are hitting civilian targets or nothing particularly, I don't know, military 
uh, by the looks of it. And they are hitting an awful lot. So at least 30 every single day. Like as Perpetua says, the floor is 30. Like along the bank, there are there are these big explosions, 30 of them happening. And there's not that many settlements up and down that river. You you can count them on your hands, you know, that they, they, they are being systematically destroyed on a daily basis uh, with with these aerial these aviation bombs these guided glide bombs they the threat of these cannot be um overestimated i you know again it goes back to wouldn't it be nice if ukraine could have like a patriot air defense system and nestled somewhere in the kherson or blast to uh, take out these planes that are releasing them from a 50 to 70 kilometer um distance behind the front line so anyway in occupied donetsk a russian fuel warehouse was reportedly struck several trucks and trains with fuel caught fire after the area was shelled russians claim it as a work of cluster munitions i think this might be in makivka here unless there's been two of these this is obviously going to hurt russian logistics somewhat considerable amount of fuel and uh, obviously then you have the tracks and the trains and carriages themselves being damaged um air raid sirens in Sevastopol this was last night uh, a smoke screen was uh, put i presume on a Kerch bridge last night well we're going to talk about that again today seeing land transport has been stopped but i think it's just been resumed says tim white last night now that is uh, so that is a common occurrence obviously in um in Crimea well this morning there's lots of talk about the Kerch bridge being covered in smoke again I don't know whether this means it's due for a strike imminently or whether this is just training uh, or just just in case uh, and maybe the missiles could be going somewhere else I don't know but anyway there is smoke along the Kerch Bridge and lots of people are talking about that now with regards to distance strikes and the successful ones on Berdyansk and Luhansk uh, no report says here after the attack on Berdyansk airport, Russian helicopters have started to appear in Taganrog Air Base in Russia. Uh, let's go and just tell you where that is. So here's my map and Taganrog is over in the Rostov sort of region here just past Mariupol and we come to uh, Taganrog there. So between Rostov and Don and the present uh, well, in the border with Russia, as it should be. Um, so we have seen a movement of airframes from Berdyansk to Taganrog. Now, the problem here is that Taganrog is is within Russia and isn't like crazy far away from the front line. The difference is going to be, it, it is going to be annoying if they're going to be using these aircraft up in, um, in Robotina. So that's 95 kilometers there from Taganrog we have uh we'll do another one um, I don't know if I can here we go uh 95 kilometers now becomes uh 225 kilometers so that is yeah that is a difference it is going to be logistically annoying but it's not like the end of the world uh and also Taganrog can then be used to attack areas in Donetsk now What's frustrating is that A, those attackums came too late. So if those attackums had come before the counteroffensive, the effect that the helicopters had on the counteroffensive, which in the first few months of counteroffensive was huge. All of those vehicles, the Ukrainian vehicles that were getting taken out not only by ATGMs and mines, but by helicopters and the ATGMs anti-tank guided missiles fired from the helicopters. If the ATACMs had been given at the beginning of the counteroffensive, then that could have had a... Uh, a meaningful effect on a successive counter offensive it really could have um so that that's annoying the other annoying thing is now the fact that the us for example as as many nations have said you can't use these weapons to attack targets inside russia that is annoying because they can still use them from tagarog and still have somewhat the same effect uh, and there's nothing ATACMs can do about that. And that's really, really frustrating. Um, so the Ukrainians have to wait until they create their own indigenous missiles to hit bases like that. But, you know, you'd hope that they, they would, f to do that kind of strike, you would need um, 
cluster of munitions really i think that'd be the most effective uh, anyway moving on to other bits and pieces uh, this i'm gonna probably do a large part of an extra on this this is fascinating right so you know i said that there are theories about uh putin dying and then putin came out on tv and gave a speech and i was like well obviously he's not dead but then there are theories that actually which putin is that because there are all these doubles and it gets close to conspiratorial thinking like conspiracy theory thinking uh, is that really high probability and then i'm like no i think i am fairly on board with him having doubles i think i think there's enough evidence to suggest there is well lo and behold this and i've missed this one in the sun of all places but anyway anton gerishchenko says japanese researchers have claimed two putin doubles Japanese experts on facial recognition and voice identification have concluded that the theory of Vladimir Putin's doubles who replace him in public events is gaining popularity. This information was published by the British tabloid The Sun. So take that and take the context of The Sun uh, doing this and then you wonder about the uh, how well founded the the initial researchers are, The you know, how... I don't know, reliable uh, they are because the sun is a bit of a dodgy source. Nonetheless, by analysing Putin's various speeches with the use of modern artificial intelligence technology, Japanese experts have concluded that the Russian president probably has at least two doubles. One of the doubles was identified as the real Putin, who attended the Red Square parade in May 2023. After comparing the facial features of this Putin with the one who drove across a Crimean bridge in the Mercedes car in December 2022, the Japanese experts found only a 53% similarity on an, an even smaller resemblance just 40% was found between the parade Putin and the president who visited Mariupol in March 2023 and Mariupol March 2023 was one that people were saying and I was saying this looks like it's a double not only is he hanging around people very closely and being much more personable than than the other Putin who stays very far away from people um, but you know the, the looks and everything so on and so forth anyway videos on state television vision showed this Putin driving through the ruined city, so him driving himself, touring the construction site of an apartment complex, talking to residents and visiting what was said to be a three-room apartment while giving instructions to Deputy Prime Minister Marat Kushnulin. The similarity between Putin's facial features in Mariupol and Putin on the Crimean Bridge was only 18%. According to Japanese researchers, their artificial intelligence-based analysis clearly indicates the likelihood of at least two Putin doubles right so okay let's just very quickly dip into this now bearing in mind the sun ran something last was this last year in yeah in october last year so this is a year old vladimir putin uses three body doubles who've had plastic surgery and real one may not exist claims budanov so the spy chief was talking about this previously and there is a really good probability of this like being being the true i mean that that's the putin that i often say is not this putin is just not the same and and that's the one that had um interesting claims about changing that is those are different earlobes those are different earlobes and that is well for me like that pretty much sells it i mean I don't, I don't need to know anymore. Like there's two different ears going on there, so something funky is going on. So there are there are I would say uh, body doubles for sure. I'm pretty convinced now. Um, that's the plastic surgery claim, and you'd assume if there were body doubles, there would be plastic surgery going on. Of course, there would be, uh, and they would be using the best people in the business to try and get this kind of stuff done right now it's a case of using artificial intelligence i could play you this video uh, of this guy talking about it but i'd have to read it to you and i'd save that for an extra but here is the uh the son talking about it here um again you know i think i think this just does make me more certain that there is there are body doubles but it also brings about the discussion of like who's the original one and is the original one even important anymore do, do, do you know what i mean like if so say the original putin has died of a heart attack this week this last week as as, as many claim like does that make any difference because can the fake putin just be utilized as the real putin and 
and has the fake Putin even become the real Putin now because he's been used so long that I don't know whether he has a political mind of his own and so on and so forth. There's just so much to talk about here, but it's dangerously close, as I say, to conspiracy thinking. But when you look at this, so this is Anton Gerashchenko again talking about how uh, quarantine rules have been relaxed and so on and so forth, uh, but actually showing the two Putins here where you've got one Putin that, that literally is kissing people's faces, random people's faces, in um, in Dagestan, I, I believe it was, uh, somewhat recently. And then you've got the other Putin who is sits as far away from human beings as he can possibly get. There were you know, spray tents to go into his, his um, pa- the Kremlin Palace in uh, during the COVID pandemic. He was very, very reticent to uh, come into human contact with people. They, the people who had worked with him had to be like, if you like, cleaned over a long period of time before they could get to, to work with him closely. So this is the one, one Putin. And here we have another Putin, behaviorally very different, as well as being um, facially and v- vocally uh, different as according to AI analyses. So yeah, uh, I'd really be interested to see what you guys think and whether you think there's merit in this or whether this is just fanciful thinking. Uh, next, uh, uh, and bear in mind that I, I'm really not a fan of that kind of fanciful type of thinking. I'm a real kind of realist, science-based person, um, evidence-based person. So for me to, to side on this me, I, I means that I really think the evidence is pretty conclusive. Uh, the UN has sufficient grounds to believe that it was the Russian Federation that struck the village of Hrosa. So this is the one where there was a, a wake taking place in a kind of a cafe, grocery store kind of area where I, I don't know now, is it 58, 59 people are now said to have died in that. And it was absolutely horrific in, in Kharkiv. Uh, the UN is now saying, yep, yeah, Russian Federation, and said in their report, they called it a violation of international humanitarian law. So again, this is a war crime. Oh yeah, 59 people, sorry. Um, the funeral of a fellow villager. I, again, it's one of these times where I say, right, if you're a pro-Kremlin voice, if you're Clive Engel that just repeats the TASS stuff in my threads, who appears to be uh, a moral vacuum, like, what what do you like clive i'm asking you what do you think of this what do you think of this is this morally good is this right that your russian friends that that your own nation because let's face it you're you're an internet research agency in st petersburg like is is this cool like is this what is this what you advocate what about the nine people that were shot by russian soldiers in volnavaka the other day Nine people, family, children, children murdered in their in their bedrooms. I mean, I've seen the imagery. The Russians have actually gone after the people who have done that. What do you think about that? What about all these war crimes? Tell me what you think about it. I'm really interested to know. Uh, it's reported that the PMC Wagner has resumed recruiting volunteers. Now, I'm a bit angry today. Um, has repute, resumed recruiting volunteers, now under the flag of the Russian National Guard, led by the son of deceased ex-leader Yevgeny Prigozhin, Pavel Prigozhin. What's going on here? So, Prigozhin's been murdered by the Kremlin, and his son is now resuming recruiting volunteers... It says, under the flag of the Russian National, Gu- Russian National Guard. I don't know what that means, whether that is... This is part of the Russian military, or is 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 he renamed it the Russian National Guard? I don't know. Uh, the only difference is that we only accept civilians who are not in detention. A representative said, "I I, I just don't get it." Um, anyway. The, they're, they're recruiting again. Russia right now has no remaining forces in Belarus except some service personnel. All of them have been withdrawn, likely deployed to the front lines. That has happened over time. We've seen that. I've reported on it a number of times. They've got fewer and fewer people and bits of equipment there. This is significant, however. It tells us that they are, one, desperate for troops, two, that there's going to be no significant attack from Belarus or no attack from Belarus. Um, and the the Ukrainians can maybe draw away some of their resources from, now that they've broadly mined a lot of that border area, they can draw some of their resources from maybe the northern border. There's there's quite a lot that can be said about this. Um, 
and uh, yeah, the, the Russians need their troops and equipment, right? ISW has said that Russian officials are concerned about losing grip, the, their grip on periphery regions. So places like Dagestan, Buratia, that uh, are fairly lawless to some degree. They're, you had those big um, pogroms in Dagestan at Makhachkala airport there. Uh, does this give a sense of Russia losing their grip on their outer regions quite possibly um, yeah we'll uh, we'll see how that develops over time anyway that's enough for me that's uh, probably too much for me thank you for watching please like subscribe and share really appreciate all your sports uh, till the pips and I'll speak to you soon mm -hmm.